Welcome to the last seminar of this term um, Garrett seminar series um, on the theme communicating uncertainty. So we're almost like three minutes past. So maybe we should um, make a start because um, today's guest is Professor Nam Kim, who is actually in the US. And for those of you who are not aware of it, um, today's is actually um, Thanksgiving. So thank you very much, um, Professor Kim for taking the time to actually speak to us um, during your holiday. So thank you very much. My pleasure. Um, so before I, I, um, I give the floor to um, Professor Kim, I would like to give you a um, brief introduction of, um, of Professor Kim. And he is an anthropological archeologist interest in the socio-political complexity, early forms of cities and the links between modern politics and cultural heritage and the material record. And he's especially interested in the cultural context and social consequences of organized violence and warfare as manifested in various um, cultural, spatial, and temporal settings. And much of his research has been um, geographically focused on Southeast Asia. And since 2005, he has been conducting archaeological research in Vietnam at the Koh Lao settlement, which um, we're, going to talk, uh, we're going to listen more about this now. So now the floor yep. is yours now. Wonderful, thank you so much. I, I just wanna thank you, Carmen and, and Rebecca and the Department of Archaeology at Cambridge. Uh, it, it is quite an honor to be part of the, the Garrett Research Seminar Series and to be talking about some of the ongoing work that my colleagues and I have been performing at the site of Koloa in Northern Vietnam. And uh, I, I wanna explore in this particular talk a little bit of the, the, the sorts of connections between the material record modern day societies and identities and politics and this idea of heritage as well, uh, how they're all kind of connected and, and to kind of give an overview of the, the history of this kind of research in the region. And to begin, we can think about this connection that has been explored by many researchers uh, in the past between archaeology and notions of nationalism or national identity. Um, I, I won't go into all of the, the quotes here, but you can kind of see the, the sorts of work that, ha that have been done. Uh, and I have some highlights here in the yellow font where we're looking at parts of East and Southeast Asia in particular, um, thinking about how these connections and these contemplations about the past go back, not just decades, not just centuries, but millennia. And there is this very clear connection between the constructions or reconstructions and interpretations of history and notions of national identity. Um, in, in areas of Southeast Asia in particular, we know that the introduction of these sorts of conversations go back well before uh, even the introduction of, of, of a sort of professional archaeology. And one of the things that, that I want to point out here would be this idea from uh, Ian Glover, thinking about archaeology and its sort of political function. And that gets at the heart of the sort of foundation that we want to be uh, building upon today. And here we have an image from the modern day country of Zimbabwe. And this of course is the site of Great Zimbabwe. And I have this here to think about or to kind of reflect the impact that Western archeology span has had coming into the picture with forms of colonialism in many parts of the world, obviously, um, over the last couple of centuries, but how these, these kinds of exercises and enterprises have worked to exoticize sites, artifacts, landscapes and so forth. And in doing so, some of it, of course, was done to um, promote research and generate new forms of knowledge. But some of it also had the effect of downplaying or even erasing local communities in terms of their heritage and knowledge and even their identity. And we know that there is this sort of push in recent years, recent decades, where archaeology is increasingly becoming sort of uh, quote unquote, de-exoticized and decolonized. And for many communities that are experiencing these moments, these moments are tied to the formation of various forms of national identity. If we think about, for example, the great enclosure at, at Great Zimbabwe and some of the artifacts and the architecture that we see there, uh, the very famous soapstone uh, bird carvings, we can see them motifs like like this, prominently displayed on currency from the modern day country on the national flag. And this conjures up this idea uh, that the constructions of the past can often involve meta narratives, 
that rely on whether it's real or imagined links between the present day and the deeper past. And sometimes, of course, this would be the pre-colonial past for many of these places. Moving to a different part of the world, to uh, the Korean Peninsula, there is this legendary account regarding the, this figure known as Tangun, who is the sort of mythical founder of the Korean civilization or people. And what's interesting is uh, back in the 1990s, researchers in North Korea claim to have found the remains of some individuals. They suspect that because of the location that perhaps these would be, this would, these would include the remains of that mythical figure known as Tangun himself. And uh, according to their research, the radiocarbon dates come back at right around exactly the same time Tangun purportedly existed. A monument was constructed. And what's interesting for me about this is the location. This is right outside of the modern day city of Pyongyang. And one might imagine that perhaps we are looking at some element of nationalist agendas and thinking and politics. Perhaps there is some form of legitimacy that comes to the North Korean regime as the sort of uh, main Korean regime of the peninsula itself, the legitimate one. And perhaps that link to that past is, uh, is entangled with that. Moving to a different area of Asia to the south, we can see in the modern day country of Cambodia, the very famous site of Angkor and its uh, massive temple of Angkor Wat. We know that the Angkorian period begins in the ninth century when Jayaraman II proclaims himself the God King. And again, we can see a connection between that distant past over a thousand years ago into the last several centuries and over the last several decades. Every flag of every regime that's come into power over the course of history um, within this area prominently displaying that symbol of Angkor Wat, perhaps making a connection to this uh, glorious past. And this takes us then to Vietnam. Uh, now I wanna focus a little bit about some of the research that we've been doing in Vietnam and how that might be put into a larger uh, historical and cultural and political context. And I have here uh, an image of a, a ceremony of festivals that are happening annually in Northern Vietnam that commemorate some of the legendary accounts tied to uh, early Vietnamese history. And we have here the term barbarians of the far South. This is to reflect the views of this part of the world by a different society. Um, and that namely would be a Sinitic one. So if we think about the, this time period, about 2000 years ago, we have the world of the Han Empire of ancient China, uh, beginning to expand its, its influence and borders and interactions with outside areas and encountering various communities on the sorts of fringes of their own cultural world. This would be areas of Northern Vietnam, what would be present day Northern Vietnam, areas of the Korean Peninsula, for instance, and others. And like many other colonial powers, uh, or imper imperial powers, the, the writers and some of the elites talking about the, the societies that they encounter describe folks who were uh, quote unquote uncivilized, barbaric, in need of civilizing. So I just wanna share a little bit. Uh, I have barbarian ancestry, so I'm of mixed ancestry. My father is Korean, hence the, uh, the last name of Kim. My mother is Vietnamese, and actually I was born in Vietnam, in Saigon in 1974. So this was right at the end, towards the end of the conflict. And we were able to escape, I won't go into details, but uh, it was an evacuation by helicopter off the rooftop of the USAID building, eventually becoming refugees and making our way across the Pacific and to the United States. But I tell this story because uh, of, of two reasons, one, it is a privilege for me to be able to work in Vietnam now. When we left, there was no inkling that we would ever be going back. And I certainly growing up didn't know if I would have any connection to, to the country. But the other part of this equation is my mother's family. Uh, she grew up in Saigon, but her family hailed from the North. She was actually born in the Northern part of the country in the Ningbing province. And growing up, she, along with her relatives, her siblings, everyone, heard about many of the stories that we're gonna be talking about today. So these various historical accounts were accepted as conventional wisdom. They were in textbooks, they were taught in schools, 
And some of it is shrouded in, in, in myth and legend. Some of it is connected to these histories that are taught. Some of it is tied to material evidence as well. So that's what I'm gonna be talking about today in terms of this area of Northern Vietnam. And of course, when we're looking at Northern Vietnam, we have to think about its, its close proximity to an emerging Chinese civilization as well. And this is, a, this is important to think about as a backdrop because if we consider the origins of Vietnamese, identity or civilization, if we go back thousands of years, we can point to that period of the Han Empire starting to come into this part of, of Northern Vietnam and actually annexing it right around the first century BCE. And the Chinese would essentially stay for about a thousand years, give or take, there were different episodes of independence, but about a thousand years, which is very significant because it is uh, part of the sort of national, the v national Vietnamese view about resistance, independence in the shadow of this larger neighbor to the north. And here, this is a, this is a quote from a recent uh, op-ed by Tung Lai, a sociologist uh, of Vietnamese descent. This is in the New York Times. The Vietnamese people have fought for thousands of years to maintain our culture and independence in the shadow of a giant neighbor. That's the backdrop that we might think about. And if we consider some of the more recent history, um, there is tapestry, for instance, at the re reunification or independence palace in Ho Chi Minh City, formerly Saigon. And this tapestry illustrates uh, a legendary account of what's known as the Van Lung Kingdom. This is part of the Hongbang dynasty. But many people in the country venerate these uh, sorts of kingdoms and, and, and ancestors. Uh, as the sorts of founders of an emerging Viet civilization. And there are purported dates from, the, from around 2800 BCE to right around 258 BCE. And these stories have been documented in later times, um, for example, in, in texts from the 15th century, talking about the Van Lung Kingdom, but also successive ones. And all of this happening before that very important ascribed date of 111 BCE, when the Han purportedly come into the area and begin their uh, annexation process. So this shows us that the reconstructions or the considerations of early Viet societies or history can be heavily tied to politics, to modern day descendant communities. Um, in 1945, this is towards the end of World War II, when, with the French beginning to come back into the picture in Vietnam, uh, we have Ho Chi Minh, for instance, giving a speech where he says, a day to remember for 25 million people, the children of Lok and the grandchildren of Hong, and Hong meaning the Hongbang dynasty. So this is a, a declaration of independence from the French, invoking some of these ancient histories. And from that point, we see in North Vietnam and then eventually in the entire country after the country is uh, reunified, a very healthy interest in historiography in the past with modern day kinds of, uh, of national identity. These narratives about struggle, about resistance against foreign powers or do domination, uh, they continue to, to surface. And we can consider that in a larger context. It's not just the Chinese, but of course the French, the Japanese, all of these other players within the, the 20th century and it's within this backdrop that the Institute of Archaeology is established in the 1960s. And what we can see as, as very interesting is the flagship journal for the Institute of Archaeology, which is part of the Academy of Social Sciences, part of uh, the state, the explorations of the past, the explorations and investigations, all the articles in that flagship journal in the early days, all of them seem to have been uh, focused on these legendary accounts. What can the material record tell us about the validity of these accounts? How do we find evidence for the existence of this kingdom or that kingdom or this individual? And so in this way, uh, the reappropriation of archeology, span taking it from the French, for instance, who had been there and, and looking at monuments in much of uh, Southeast Asia, moving that from a, a, a foreign perspective to a more local one. But we can see that happening in this larger historical context of 
nationalism, of independence, of self-determination, all coming intertwined hand in hand at the same time. And when we think about early Viet societies or proto-Vietnamese societies, of course, the area of interest for us would be up in the north. This is widely considered by many people in Vietnam to be the crucible or the foundation of an emerging Vietnamese civilization. And for that part of the world, there are two uh, topics that, that are most pertinent. One would be what's known as the Dong Sun culture. This is an archeological culture. And then the other would be uh, the Kolwa site. And this is where I've been doing work for a number of years now that's tied to legend, to history, and also to archeology. span and here I would point out that this, this enterprise of de-exoticizing the past, um, it's not just in the 20th century, but we can see it happening at a couple of major pivotal points. One, we can talk about after independence from China, after that occurs various Vietnamese dynasties or courts come into power, and there is a healthy interest in the pre-Synetic past. And so in, during these quote unquote medieval eras, we see uh, chroniclers and writers describing the, that past. And then we also see, again, as we just pointed out in the mid 20th century, after the French colonial period, this revisiting of history and the distant past. So I wanna now talk a little bit about the Dong Sun culture and then move into the Goa case specifically. This is a, an image of a Dong Sun culture boat coffin burial at Viet Ke. This was excavated in the 1960s. Um, probably one of the most important or significant um, of these boat tombs that have been found associated with the Dong Sun culture, something like a hundred different artifacts, mostly bronzes, uh, recovered from just this one context. Um, I believe in 2013, the prime minister of Vietnam recognized this tomb as a, as a national treasure. But we have examples of Dong Sun materials, specifically bronzes and other kinds of materials that show us what life ways might have been like for these communities right around the middle part of the first millennium BCE. And one of the things that we can see in some of these de depictions uh, it would be some of the cultural practices um, on whether it's utilitarian or ritual vessels, um, imagery of boats, for instance, perhaps signifying the importance of riverine travel and exchange through these systems connecting various regions uh, within this area. And we, of course, know that the Dong Sun culture is all over Northern Vietnam. We have over a hundred different sites that have been identified, um, burials, workshops, and settlements. It's also within this time period that we start to see uh, signs of social differentiation, status, some individuals, according to the mortuary data, some individuals having higher status presumably due to the number of grave goods and the, the value of some of these goods that are placed within these contexts. And we know we're talking about wet rice farming communities, structures that are built on stilts above the floodplain, um, connections throughout the region, but also with communities further afield, potentially using river systems uh, like the very uh, significant Red River connecting many communities uh, that might have straddled that's a uh, super highway. And we also see very sophisticated bronzes. The Dong Sun, in fact, are famous for their bronze materials, uh, and in particular, the very iconic bronze drum, uh, known um, as the Dong Sun drum by some, but uh, various appellations, depending on what kind of research and where you are in the world. But we see examples like this. This is uh, a bronze drum known as the Golua drum. This was found at Golua. Uh, back in the 1980s. And it is one of many examples uh, of some 300 early Dong Sun bronze drums that have been found in Vietnam. About 200 come from this area of Northern Vietnam, uh, the Red River Valley and area. We have all kinds of examples that are prominently displayed at the National Museum of Hanoi. And that particular drum, um, from Goloa is about 72 kilograms. People estimate that maybe one to 7,000 kilograms of crude ore materials may have been involved in the production for this one specimen. And if you look closely at it, you can still make out some of the iconography. And if you look at the tympanum, for instance, you see this sunburst or star-shaped motif in the center. 
And in one of the bands going around, you can see various kinds of uh, birds, shapes of what we think might be cranes. There are feathered warriors with spears also. But if we consider those motifs and we think about modern day Vietnam, uh, this is a photo I took a few years ago uh, when I was visiting the city of Tang Hoa for the first time, driving into the city on the outskirts along the highway, you're confronted with this massive monument. And what I would point out here is in the center at the bottom there is a replica of a drum, one of these bronze drums of the Dung Sun culture, and then those cranes um, also constructed in this large monument. So we see these motifs, we see that on all kinds of items. This is tea in Vietnam with the Dong Sun cultural icons prominently displayed. It's on postcards, it's in museums, it's ubiquitous. And of course, we can think about why is this particular culture so important? And one answer might be, well, it's because this is the last archeological or prehistoric society that was in the area prior to the annexation by the Han Empire. So this is right on the eve of the so-called Sinaitic domination periods, which span that period of about 100 BCE to the 10th century of the Common Era. So we can see, again, appeals being made to the past. And once the Han come into the area, there are a couple of traditional sources we have for this reconstructing history in this particular part of the world. The Han, of course, come into the area and there are accounts uh, based on what they observe. And these accounts describe some of the life ways of communities in this area. There is the ascribed date of 111 BCE. There's very little direct reference to the Goldwa site, which we'll be talking about shortly. But there are uh, descriptions of the of various communities being encountered by, by Han people. And many of these communities are being described as relatively unsophisticated, backwards, as in need of civilization, um, that the, the Han had to teach forms of farming and agriculture, uh, forms of metalworking, and so forth. Now, of course, we can take these accounts with a grain of salt. Perhaps there is some element of colonial or imperial bias uh, connected to some of these accounts. There's a sort of ethnocentric perspective that may be connected to them. So they give us clues, but perhaps they can be questioned and challenged. Now, here is a geographic orientation. This is the northern part of Vietnam, what's known as the Bac Bo region. And you can see the river system coming from the Yunnan Plateau of southwestern China. Uh, that's the Red River that stretches some 1,200 kilometers through the mountains to the Gulf of Bac Bo, this uh, area known as the Gulf of Tonkin as well. And in that delta is the modern day city of Hanoi, and it's also the home of the Goloa site. And this takes us into the next part of the lecture. Uh, and I'll talk about another traditional source of information as well. So here is an image, a satellite image, a recent photo showing us the Hanoi area, the northeastern part of it, um, the Tunglong Citadel, which was the capital of this, this uh, various regimes of uh, Viet identity and civilization from about um, the 11th century onward. And what I really enjoy about this picture is the juxtaposition. So we have these two sorts of capital cities. We have the Red River. Uh, this is a game I like to play with my students is can you spot the, the archeological site? And if you were looking up in the Northern part of that area, you would have spotted it. So that's the Goloa site. And what I really enjoy about this picture is it illustrates how this geographic space has been important for historical and political purposes of a Viet identity going back thousands of years. It's been a, a very important political space. And to give you some sense of the scale and size of the Gola site, this is an image of New York City's uh, of in Central Park in Manhattan. And I believe many of you probably are in this geographic space here on the bottom right. If we had the chance to meet in person, perhaps I would have joined you there, maybe in the future. But we also have then the Goloa site, roughly the same scale, just to give you an idea about the size. And what you can see from this satellite image, there's a lot of modern day habitation at Goloa. There are the outlines and remains of what looks to be uh, 
an enclosure system of some kind. And if you think about the scale, we're talking about a site that was probably about 600 hectares, um, 450 of which would be enclosed in that, that outer third wall that we can make out there. But if you look at that size, we're talking about 1,100 football fields. And I, I do mean American football uh, in this case. But this is a massive site. And for Southeast Asia, mainland Southeast Asia, this is unprecedented. Uh, we see examples of this sort, this sort of settlement or urbanism in parts of ancient China approaching those kinds of scales. But for Southeast Asia, uh, in this time period, before the common era, this is fairly unprecedented. And here is an image, again, of the, of the site. And what we can see from satellite images is a series of three walls. This is the innermost wall, which is uh, approximately 1.65 kilometers in its perimeter. It's punctuated by bastions. We have the middle wall here. That's about six and a half kilometers around in this sort of irregular shape pattern. And then we have the outer wall. This is about eight kilometers around. Those are the ones that we can see. Uh, we have done research and there are hints from textual accounts that there are other walls and our early indications, I can answer this later on as well. Uh, our early indications are that probably there are more uh, ramparts to, to, to consider. But I want to point out a couple of things here. Um, one, the walls still stand today in the various states of disrepair, in some places up to uh, 10 meters in height, maybe 30 meters wide at the base. Um, they're associated with outer ditches or moats. And people estimate that anywhere between one to two million cubic meters of earthen materials would have been involved in the construction process. And you can see uh, right in the middle, there, there is what is the Kolok commune living in this area. So many thousands of people habitating this area today, kind of limiting the access we have in order to answer questions about the site. And I'll, I'll talk about that in just a second. But when we see this site, there are ongoing conversations and debates about when the site comes into existence and who might have been responsible. Uh, and there are various accounts, legendary accounts and folk tales that are connected to that set of questions. Uh, Many of you probably recognize this image. This is, of course, uh, a depiction of King Arthur from Monty Python and the Holy Grail, probably my favorite depiction of King Arthur. Um, but we have legendary accounts here about King Arthur and how King Arthur comes to power, the Lady of the Lake giving the sword of Excalibur to the king as a sort of symbol of power and, and a source of, of uh, his ability to control areas. Uh, I have this here not because there's any connection. I don't claim that there is any connection between King Arthur and, and Vietnam and Gaulois. But for me, there's an interesting analogy here because the Vietnamese have their own version of a sort of story. Um, related to Gaulois, there, is, there are tales talking about an, an individual by the name of An Zeng Vu, who comes to power in the third century BCE. This is during the time of the Dongsun archeological culture. And at an ascribed date of 258 BCE takes power. The king uh, was receiving advice from a magic turtle that came out of the water, explaining to the king how to build his defenses for his capital, for his seat of power. Also giving up one of its claws to the king and telling the king to use that claw as the trigger mechanism for a crossbow. So this magic crossbow would allow the king to vanquish all of his rivals and enemies and to uh, found his kingdom and keep it, maintain it. So we have these sorts of Vietnamese traditions in contrast to the uh, Sinitic descriptions, the Chinese texts that describe these barbarians in the area when they came into the, the, the region. But the Vietnamese tales talk about a very different kind of circumstance where we have what's known as the Olak Kingdom, uh, started by An Zeng Vung at 258 BCE. He overthrows the last of the Hongbang dynasty, the, the Hong kings, to take power. And he constructs the Gaulois site as his capital. According to these legends, there are nine walls for Gaulois in this sort of concentric snail shape. 
And this has been the basis for conventional wisdom in Vietnam. As I mentioned, my mother's side of the family and her relatives, they grew up in school reading about this history, about uh, An Zung Vo and the Goldwa site. Um, we can see, even if you go to Vietnam today, the, the stories persist. There are all kinds of uh, statues, there are rituals, there's, there are festivals to commemorate this, this series of events and these histories. Um, I, I've also recently come across video games that depict the king holding a magic crossbow. So you can see how this, uh, these stories and these symbols still permeate the, the national identity, the modern day identity of Vietnam. Now, when we consider these sources, one of the things to one of the things to think about is potential issues with the folktales themselves, with the Vietnamese folktales. Um, many of these stories were not officially documented or recorded until well after the fact. So during that medieval period, maybe around the 13th, 14th, 15th centuries of the common era. So they're being written at that point in time and they're describing events that happened many centuries earlier. So, we have some issues potentially with that. We also might consider, and this has been pointed out by various uh, researchers like Liam Kelly, Yu Ting Nguyen, who talk about the possibility that once there's independence from the Vietnamese after the Sinaitic domination periods, there may have been a, a healthy interest in finding a, a glorious pre-Chinese past. And perhaps those sorts of motivations may have colored or uh, allowed embellishments to happen for some of these histories as they were being written and produced. So this has led to debates about uh, how some of these traditions may be accurate or inaccurate, how they may be invented, or how they may have been used to exploit uh, political agendas. So we have these conflicting depictions. We can see an episode, an early episode of this, this kind of uh, nationalistic thinking, if you will. Not quite the same that we would see in the 20th century, but a concern for this distant past for political reasons. But we have these conflicting depictions. The Vietnamese traditions on the one hand saying that civilization comes about in this area through local indigenous developments. And on the other hand, you have these textual accounts from the Chinese claiming that it is imposed, civilization is imposed by this foreign power. And this gives us a couple of different models to consider, uh, one from the outside, one indigenous and from the inside. And we might also consider the possibility that it's, it is actually a combination of the two. In any case, what we can say is that archeological information is going to be very important for these ongoing debates. And the one question we might answer, of course, the big question is what's going on a, a Han byproduct? And this takes us to the third part of the lecture and some of the work that my colleagues and I have been undertaking at Goa. So we've been excavating uh, going back to about 2007 uh, to try to find information and details that can help with these debates and help our understanding about the site as it emerges. Now, I showed an image showing um, the dense modern day occupation at the site. So we have limited areas where we can access information. But one of the things that we thought about was to use the ramparts themselves, the walls, as a sort of proxy measure. So if we can find information that gives us ideas about how the walls were constructed, perhaps that information can tell us about chronology, about construction methods, and a little bit about cultural identity. So perhaps that would be a nice measure for the city's emergence and that development process. And so we've undertaken a series of excavations at various places along the, the monumental wall system, the middle, outer, and inner walls. And what I can tell you is that much of the information that we've come up with is fairly consistent between walls. So it gives us this idea that, that this was a system that was likely uh, contemporaneous, probably uh, responsible, the responsible society constructed all of it in, in this sort of systematic pre-planned fashion. And I'll just give a few highlights of the data uh, before talking a little bit more about the implications. So this was from the initial excavation through the middle wall. We cut a five meter wide trench through the wall. 
It was about 26 meters wide uh, at the base from foot to foot with stepped or tiered levels going across about four meters in height. And generally speaking, we, we could identify a few major chronological periods with various building phases within them. And a lot of our information comes to us from uh, some of the artifacts, the styles of the artifacts, as well as uh, radiocarbon dates from some of the organic materials that were recovered. And for us, the period of interest here really is this middle period. This would be phases two, three, and four. I'll just highlight very briefly what we have here. So here's another image of that profile of the middle wall. At the, the very bottom, stratified underneath the massive rampart monumental construction, we have uh, what appear to be architectural features made out of clay materials, as well as pottery from the Dongsun culture. The radiocarbon dates tell us, and this is consistent with the pottery styles for the Dongsun culture, that we have a window of about 500 to 300 calibrated BCE for some of those materials at the very bottom. This is before the rampart gets constructed. Then we have phases two, three, and four of the middle period. And we have dates, very little artifacts stratified within the construction methods uh, or, or layers, but we have dates from organic materials giving us a window of about 300 to 100 calibrated BCE. It's so within phase four that we have the bulk of our artifacts. Uh, along with piled earth, we have what appear to be uh, roof tiles, the fragments of ceramic roof tiles. And they come in the thousands. And we see them all over the Kolwa site. And I'll talk about that in just a second. But what's interesting here is that we have various kinds of construction sequences and techniques, uh, such as rammed earth. In that middle period, at the top, we have what appear to be historical era refurbishment or amplification phases that happen with thin layers of rammed earth. The, the phase four piled earth, we have roof tiles showing us this, what we suspect to be the chronological upper limit for the ancient rampart itself before refurbishment efforts that happen later on. Roof tiles are everywhere. Anywhere you go at Colua, anywhere where the wall might be uh, collapsing, anywhere where you put a, a road cutting through the rampart, you will see at the same stratigraphic level, these roof tiles. And there are all kinds of hypotheses about why they're there. The obvious one could be that there was some kind of structure on top of the walls, maybe some kind of roof. Um, some have argued that perhaps because we don't see post holes, at least not in the areas we investigated, that maybe instead of structures on top of the wall, maybe this is debris coming from nearby buildings. Maybe it's to help shore up against erosion because of the monsoonal rains that we experience in this part of the world to help maintain the integrity of, of the wall. Those are still ongoing uh, debates and questions, but charcoal was recovered in context with the wall. We have thermoluminescence dating as well, showing us this window, this upper limit. So it reinforces the idea that around 300 to 100 BCE is the period of interest. What is also interesting about the roof tiles is that for that period of time, there are, roof, there are no roof tiles anywhere else in this region in Northern Vietnam. They are only found at this one particular site of Gold Wall. Uh, we know, and I can talk more about this in the Q&A afterwards, we know that roof tiles have been found um, in various parts of ancient China, and usually in more elite or royal contexts for those kinds of structures and buildings. And so one interpretation is perhaps because of the early dates, this is before the Han come into the area, there might be some knowledge of those practices and perhaps an appropriation of that symbolic kind of practice, signifying that this site is perhaps an elite or royal settlement of some kind. Some of uh, my Vietnamese colleagues have also excavated in parts of the inner wall. And this series of excavations uncovered very interesting materials, including furnaces to produce bronzes, casting molds, and other kinds of bronze artifacts. And what's interesting here is we have molds for crossbow points. We also have evidence of cross, bronze crossbow triggers. And this is tantalizing when we think about some of those legendary accounts, which takes us now to uh, the fourth part of the lecture. 
this is a statue at the site of Goldwa today. Uh, it is meant to symbolize an individual by the name of Kao Lo, who was purportedly the general uh, giving advice to the, the King An Zheng Vung. Um, and you can see held in the hands of the general is a crossbow. Uh, there are some people that make the argument that perhaps that turtle in that legend may actually be a, a symbol uh, for this individual, this, this actual person. That's debatable, but there are, there are potential connections here. But there are connections between the material past and some of these accounts. And I wanna talk about that in just a second, but first I wanna mention something uh, regarding the, the finds themselves on the monumental rampart walls. For me, when we think about the scale of construction, and if we put, take into account the radiocarbon dates that we have and the sequences of construction that seem to tie all of these ramparts and the moat system into a larger system. I, I, I would argue that we're looking at some form of centralized or sustained political power or authority that has control over labor, over all the vast resources that would be required to produce something like these ramparts. And this, of course, does not even take into account all the other kinds of architecture that would have been associated with the settlement. And perhaps there's some form of messaging as well. Look at what we are able to accomplish. Look at what we are able to build. And this would have been very unprecedented uh, landscape modification. Nothing on this scale had been done before. We have other kinds of moated settlements in Southeast Asia that go back uh, from this time period and even earlier, um, but none come to the same kind of scale in terms of size. And we can consider perhaps all of those trappings then of monumentality and resource control and potential power uh, as the trappings of state level authority that might be institutionalized and durable. Uh, some would say, well, perhaps if, if we don't have secure radiocarbon dates, uh, you know, years ago, people wondered if perhaps the walls were constructed through many, many centuries or even millennia over accretion. But the radiocarbon dates show us this, this smaller window. And the argument for me would be that we do have some kind of centralized authority. The other implication, if we go back to those Sinaitic accounts regarding the Southern barbarians of this world, uh, for me, the evidence suggests that that particular perspective is, is not valid. We set, seem to have very clear evidence of political or social complexity, quote unquote, civilization that exists here before the Han come into the picture. We have intensive forms of, of wet rice farming, very high, uh, highly developed uh, forms of bronze working, and the trappings of what we might consider civilization. Is it imposed by a foreign power? Is it indigenous? My answer here would be it's probably a, a, a bit of both. We can see connections from our earlier archaeological cultures leading into the Dongsan period, but we can also point out interregional connections that have been happening as far back as the Neolithic of this area. Uh, what happens in northern Vietnam does not happen in a vacuum. Right around this same time period, in the mid-first millennium BCE, of course, the Warring States period is occurring over the mountains in parts of the Central Plains. And it's not inconceivable that during those times of conflict and turmoil, there are push factors moving communities, moving families. Uh, we see a, probably a state of flux. And some of these ideas and practices that maybe are, 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 have a very long history in, in the Central Plains, like stamped earth, like roof tiles, for instance, those ideas and practices make their way into this area. So even though it's not being imposed, perhaps it's inspiring or being appropriated by locals in this area. Getting back to the larger question about legend and early Vietnam, I'm often asked if the evidence from the Goloa site indicates the existence or uh, validates the existence of the figure known as An Zheng Vung or the Olak kingdom that he purportedly founds. Uh, for me personally, there are very tantalizing hints, but beyond having some support for some of those legendary accounts and textual descriptions, I stop a little bit short because I'm not sure if we can eliminate all other possibilities. There may have been other figures 
associated with the site. The, the name Anzeng Room could have been uh, associated with multiple individuals. Um, until we find, for example, a tomb that holds remains from that time period, maybe with some kind of symbol, symbol or writing that signifies Anzeng Room, it would be difficult to say. Nevertheless, we can point out that many of the elements described in those legendary accounts, we find the material correlates for them. Uh, the bronze crossbow technologies, for instance, the plowshares used for intensive farming, the casting molds, this what appears to be centralized control of some of these production facilities. All that points to some kind of complex society existing here, potentially connected to historically uh, described societies. But for me, the conservative approach is to start with this idea that we do see a powerful society here in place well before Han annexation. So this window of 300 to 100 calibrated BCE in particular, what I would call the global polity. This now takes us into the last part of the lecture where I wanna talk a little bit about the idea of Goloa and how the past is connected to the present. Uh, again, this is an image of a festival happening that commemorates Andenbrö, the Ola kingdom, and some of those events that happened uh, millennia ago. And this happens every year. And we can go to Goloa and see there are museums and interpretive centers, there are exhibits, there is a, a source of national pride here. And it's also a, an attraction for tourists from within Vietnam and from outside of the country. Uh, there is an, an intellectual attraction as well. Many researchers coming in from all over the country and outside of it as well to look at this particular episode of history. Uh, I can also point out in recent years, the healthy interest by school children uh, in the educational process and public awareness. Uh, this image I find very interesting and, and fun to look at. We have school children using clay to reconstruct the, the walls of Goloa. I, I wasn't there, this was posted uh, on the, uh, the Conservation Center's website, but I can only imagine maybe this was an exercise given to the students by their teachers to help educate them about the history and the monuments there. Also, I've seen these images as well, where we have school children also experimenting with crossbow technologies again, showing this connection. They may or may not know all of those details and histories or the archaeology, but there is a sense, there is an awareness about that time period and about that episode. And for me, all of this illustrates this larger uh, observation about the power of the past. So if we think about that legendary past, there is an episode in the 10th century. So I mentioned the, the Baktuk periods, the domination periods for for, uh, for Northern Vietnam that lasts from 111 BCE all the way through the 10th century. What happens in the 10th century is there is an individual by the name of Ngo Quyen, who is uh, a local Vietnamese general who leads uh, a sort of rebellion and a, a battle that happens. This is a famous battle in Vietnamese history, the Battle of the Bac Dang River, where uh, he had, this general had a knowledge about the tides and was able to construct these uh, spikes in the water that uh, trapped some of the, uh, the Chinese warships. This was viewed as a major milestone for uh, independence on the path to, to independence for the Vietnamese. Uh, he proclaimed himself the first Vietnamese king in the 10th century in, in terms of uh, independence. But what's interesting about this is at that point in time, the locus of political power had already shifted. It, it was in Hanoi, in the Hanoi area. And the Han were, were using that area as well as a sort of political administrative center. But Ngo Quyen, once he comes to power, according to text, uh, shifts across the river back to the Goloa site, which had been largely abandoned as a political capital for centuries. And it suggests a couple of possibilities. One, that some of the stories and artifacts and landscapes associated with Goloa were still viewed and commemorated by successive generations as part of this, this glorious hist historical period. The other 
implications. Perhaps Mo Quinn himself was using that gesture, using the seat of power for his new dynasty and kingdom, Echo Law, to invoke some kind of connection to that past. Going back to what we were saying earlier about real or imagined links to the historical past and helping to legitimize present day political agendas. Perhaps there was some element of that happening for Mo Quinn himself. And if we think about that, and you know, we think about the kinds of rituals that occur, we can talk about how these activities bind people. They instill a sense of community. They can instill and promote sense, a sense of national pride. And this illustrates the, the power of these places that are tied to history, the stories, the landscapes, the material artifacts, and how these rituals combine all of these elements within these spaces for heritage. And we can see how this is tied to the preservation of that heritage, as well as to the construction of, of modern identities. So the past, in particular, the archeological past can be a very important source of cultural capital and a foundation for national imagination. When we look at it from that perspective, then it brings to mind all kinds of complexities of cultural heritage. We know that the Vietnamese are uh, seeking UNESCO World Heritage site, uh, Heritage site status for Goa. When we were excavating, we were constantly visited by politicians, by local community members, by leaders, uh, by researchers and tourists, uh, including the Deputy Prime Minister of Vietnam at the time, the former president, Chen Duc Lung, visiting our excavations, all with an interest to ask, what are you finding? We already know the history of Goa. We know the history of the Ola Kingdom. So, yeah, what, what kinds of information are you finding? With the, and I'm sure on the in the back of their minds, what might challenge uh, some of those conventional histories that we already have? This speaks to the complexities of the cultural heritage and issues of cultural heritage. And I I, I want to look at again this paper. Uh, by Ian Glover. And in this particular publication, he describes archaeology being in this, when it's pressed into the service of political nationalism, it can be a double edged sword. In some cases, it can be misused or misappropriated. It can, but at the same time, it can also educate and encourage public interest in the past and in heritage. And there's a sort of tension that we can draw upon where we can see. Uh, uh, tendencies that nationalize, but also decolonize within archaeology. And perhaps these are not mutually exclusive endeavors. They can be very productive in various ways for different stakeholders and different viewpoints, but that would require a healthy conversation about it and flexibility and awareness. Here I'm inspired by much of the work being done by many colleagues of mine in, in areas of Southeast Asia, including uh, Miriam Stark, Stephen Akabato, Pipal Hang, who talk about these uh, notions of community archaeology, where multiple perspectives are brought together. Stakeholders who are parts of the descendant communities, some of which may have easy access to these histories and materials, some of which may not be, uh, may not have easy access. But all of those views can be very important. They can offer us uh, contrasting perspectives, sometimes maybe co conflicting perspectives, but they can also highlight the ways in which we ought to think about the past and be more inclusive. I don't pretend that there are easy answers for these kinds of questions, but uh, perhaps that is a very good starting point is to have a, a conversation or a recognition that there are potential agendas and biases and multiple viewpoints that need to be considered. Now in that spirit, um, one of the things that, that I participated in when I first started working in Vietnam, I remember having a conversation with the director of the conservation agency that is in charge of uh, cultural heritage and preservation at Go Law. And one of the things that he asked me is, you, you, you have our permission to collaborate and work at this site, but one uh, request we have is eventually whatever you publish has to be widely disseminated in Vietnamese. It cannot be just in the English language. Um, and this was this led to this outcome here. This is a book that I worked on 
um, with the conservation agency and with many of my colleagues in Vietnam at the Institute of Archaeology uh, about the Goa site and its history, published in Vietnamese and in English. And here we offered various kinds of perspectives. Having that publication, this was offered uh, free of charge to communities within the country, but having those kinds of efforts and also the kind of work that we were doing involving local community members uh, constantly coming to the site, but also being a part of the, the project, the various projects, uh, offering seminars, offering conferences and workshops to disseminate that information. All this was important for us. And what's interesting for me about this, this book and what is sort of pertinent to the, the topic of communicating uncertainty in archaeology for this seminar is uh, if we think about, for instance, my own work and my ideas and, and interpretations and arguments, they stand in contrast to some of the work and some of the ideas of my colleagues. Um, here we have a sort of introduction or foreword by the uh, director of the conservation agency. And I, I have it here in Vietnamese and there is in the introduction a translation as well. But what I would point out here are a couple of things. The Vietnamese view the Ola kingdom as historical reality. In fact, the first state, potentially, of Vietnamese history. And so when we think about the Goa site itself, this is tied to those kinds of histories. And this brings up various perspectives, right? Because, again, for me, uh, I was a bit more conservative, or I am a bit more conservative, in how far I'm willing to push some of these interpretations. And instead of saying the Ola kingdom, I'm more comfortable saying the Goa polity. But that brings up other kinds of questions. And these, these ideas about ownership of the past, who owns, who can claim ownership of the past. And when we say past, of course, we mean forms of knowledge, the material record and so forth. But not only that, but how do some of these claims shape how we interpret, how we communicate that history to different audiences? And this case, uh, I think highlights some of those challenges and, and opportunities where we can talk about the decolonization of archeological practices and of material histories uh, and the collection and promotion of these materials, how that requires uh, multiple stakeholders, multiple participants in this process and engagement with different communities and a larger dedication to public awareness. And I think I'll stop there and I'd be very happy to answer any questions anybody might have and to hear your perspectives about any of these kinds of materials. Thank you. Wonderful, Nam. Thank you so much for that absolutely brilliant talk. Really fascinating. Um, I see we already have a question um, from Paul, which is wonderful. So Nam, I don't, if you're happy to stop sharing your screen, and for those of you who are comfortable with putting your cameras on, um, it makes for a, a more friendly conversation when we can see some faces, um, if you're happy. Um, uh, yes, hopefully we can um, have some questions. Paul, was that a hand up or was that an accidental hand? <laughs> um, it, it was an accidental hand, but I'm now thrown into it. And you know, uh, thank you. That was a really wonderful presentation and, and, and many, many resonances. I mean, you began with Great Zimbabwe and, and, and obviously I, I teach Africa and, and most of my work has been on Africa. So lots of resonances there. Um, and I was struck right at the beginning when in those various quotes you had from a number of scholars about, including Gina Barnes um, and Ian Glover, about the sort of, you know, well before professional archaeology was in place, um, people constructed pasts, not just from those oral histories and the literary texts, but also the material remains and so forth. And I suppose that my, my question would be, to what extent could we call those practices of creating an archaeology that draws a, a, a historical narrative that draws on material remain prior to professional archaeology, to what extent can we call that indigenous archaeology? That's a very interesting question. Um, I. I think there is an argument to be made that we are looking at forms of indigenous archaeology, but I would also point out that, uh, and, and this applies to the present day as well, these constructions uh, don't always represent the views of everyone. 
that might be part of that community or part of that society. Uh, we, we can point to the fact that histories are often written by elites or those that enjoy higher status, or they are influenced and shaped by those sorts of communities. So when we talk about the, the histories that are being produced and the kinds of identities that they might represent or purport to detail, it's not always universally inclusive. So I, I think then it, it, it raises the question of what we mean by indigenous. Um, certainly, it, it re represents a, a segment of that community, but not necessarily all of it. And I, I, I don't know if that answers your question, but I, I think that it, it's, I would straddle the fence there. Mm. I would say that we do see forms of indigenous knowledge production. And in that case, forms of indigenous archaeology, because of course, archaeology wasn't invented by the West in, just in the last century or so. There has always been a healthy interest in the past, no matter where, what part of the world you're in, and what kinds of, of methods are being used to explore that past. Um, but how it's viewed and how we define it, archaeology or antiquarianism or other forms of, of exploration, that, that is for a different discussion, I think. Thank you. No, no, I think that was, yeah, I like that answer. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Shadia, you have your hand. Thank you so much. That was really amazing and very interesting uh, talk. I really enjoyed it. And it does ring the bell from uh, my back from my country. I come from Sudan. Um, and I could see from uh, your presentation that consecutive governments, they had interest in the past. They spent quite a lot of money to uh, highlight the past, to make it present and uh, visible. Um, and education in every way. Uh, my question is about heritage and identity. Does everybody, because I know they spend quite a lot to uh, identify with the heritage or do they you have some compensation as well? Uh, well, in, in, in the case of Vietnam, I would say it, it, there is probably contestation as well. I would imagine that applies for most places, if not all places. Um, this relates to, to the last question and the last answer as well. Um, these histories don't represent everyone. And I think we have to consider the fact that not everyone is consulted in the process of explore, exploring that past, but also interpreting and maintaining that cultural heritage. Who gets to decide the kinds of research questions being asked? Who gets to decide how the answers to those questions get displayed? Um, whether in publications that might be for scholarly audiences or maybe for uh, the lay audience in, in more uh, general kinds of publications or even in uh, exhibits at museums, how that gets displayed and who makes those decisions. Um, it's impossible, I would argue, to include everyone's perspective. That wouldn't be uh, logistically possible or, or practical. But um, I think there has been an acknowledgement that there are groups that may not be represented? And what can we do to, to try to make sure that we start to incorporate? Because the, at the end of the day, there are some forms of knowledge that some people might have biases against and other forms that people accept as quote unquote scientific, right? Um, and I, I have to admit, even when I started this research, I, I took those legends as, with a very healthy grain of salt, not thinking that I would find actual evidence supporting them. Um, but the more I, I did the research, the more I came to realize we have various forms of knowledge that are just as valid as each other. And it's up to the archeologists to test. And the, the material record is important, but it's not the only source of information because obviously the other sources can color our perceptions and interpretations of that record. Does that, I, I hope that answers your question. Yes, yes it did really. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Graham, you have to that. Anyway, it follows actually from, from the answer you were just giving, Nam. I, I had a slight involvement in kickstarting the archaeology that um, partly underpins the, the, that successful case of the Trang An uh, World Heritage Site, which is a, a cultural and natural site. And I just wondered what, what your thoughts are about you know, how, how attracted you are by the idea of this site becoming a World Heritage Site, that you know the, the kind of debates and issues about that sort of official imprinting 
you know, and and you know, that people talk about it being part of that sort of colonial agenda, the whole, you know, what World Heritage stands for. Plus all of that you were talking about now, different engagements, different people's engagements, because in a way that that that's that's sort of it's an approach, of course, that many of us are sympathetic with, but it doesn't sit easily with the idea of a kind of an official a World Heritage Site and the kind of official view that would uh, would be generated from that. I just wonder what your thoughts were on that score. Yeah, um, that's a very difficult question to answer. I, I don't, for me personally, I can see the benefits of, of that kind of status and identification for a site and the kinds of... Um, interest that it might generate. But I, I know that many researchers talk about some of the, the negative aspects or the potential impacts. Um, I, it's difficult for me to say. Um, I think it's a, a case by case basis. I, I don't think that it, it is fair to make a, a sort of blanket statement about the, the benefits of World Heritage Site status or why it should be avoided. I think it really depends on not only the country but also the site itself and the communities around that site. Because obviously when that kind of status is conferred upon a place, it can have an impact on communities living in that area. Uh, potentially their perspectives about it, their access to some of these spaces, uh, the fact that that kind of recognition will likely bring in more tourism, which some people would welcome and some people might find problematic. So uh, I'm not trying to avoid answering your question, but I, 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 don't, know, <laughs> I don't know how, how, how to answer that particular question. I, I don't know the, the circumstances for the Chang'an site as well as I should. But if you, uh, take the, if you take the kind of easier part of that, I mean, how would you want to see the site sort of, the past of the site presented uh, in, you know, in that kind of, you know, if it becomes some kind of world heritage site with, with the right. official, how would you want all of this that you've talked about? How do you want that, that that told to the international audiences, the local audiences, community audiences? Yeah. Uh, so hypothetically, if Goa were to be presented in that fashion, um, and you're I, in, if you're in charge of the presentation, you know, you know how would you? Yeah. How, how would you translate a you know an intellectual seminar like we've had now to actually what the story you'd tell? To yes. Me. Okay. I appreciate the challenging question. I, I think it would be, for me, sort of along the lines of what I presented here today. I would make clear my own sort of uh, argument, but at the same time, I would recognize that there are histories that are tied to the site, and they're just as valid to present publicly, and they should be acknowledged. So, uh, the, the legends about Anzheng Vung, for instance, and the Ola Kingdom, those should be health, healthily displayed and, and, and prominently featured. They should not be avoided because that's part of the local community's engagement with the site. And that's, that's a source of material that can be further explored. But if you're referring to that, that kind of presentation or information, uh, I think the more inclusive it can be, the better. Um, the challenge is where to put that box, right? The boundaries, what, what sorts of perspectives may not be included because you can't put everything in there, but that, that would be my, my sort of simple answer. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> um, Federica, I'm going to give you the last question. Um, thanks. Thank you very much. And terrific and very inspiring. Uh, I wanted to ask if you could perhaps expand on the use of misuse and selective uh, choice of what particular portion of the past um, is used today in politics, because as you were sort of referring to your case study and uh, the use of, particular, of a particular period uh, that precedes the, the annexation of Vihan, I'm, I'm thinking that, for instance, as an Italian, in Italy, we have uh, um, dominant references to our Roman past mm -hmm. in politics, in anything that really shapes um, Ital the Italian political landscapes. And that is a specific part of, of, of our national identity. So I wonder whether you could perhaps expand a little bit on that. Thank you. Sure, thank you for that question. Um, in terms of 
examples of what we might consider misappropriate or misuses. Um, you know, if we, if we think about Europe, for instance, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm considering the histories of professional archaeology as used by, by Germany, in the Nazi regime, and how some of the interpretations offered by archaeologists were used then as a, as a, as a political tool to justify the expansion of German borders, for instance, um, saying that anywhere where we, where we find artifacts that might be related to ancient German culture, that gives us uh, the license to be able to go in uh, and, and, and take some territory. We can think about um, in South, Southeast Asia today or in East Asia, uh, the, the South China Sea or what's known as the Eastern Sea for the Vietnamese. Uh, I'm sure all of us here are, are aware about the, the ongoing disputes over the Spratly Islands and some of the islands in the sea and how, um, you know, before the 1950s, most people didn't care so much about these islands, but after people discovered petroleum deposits underneath the sea, seabed, um, all of a sudden, many countries coming into the picture saying, well, actually, we have historical records showing that we have control over some of these places or we find artifacts, archeological artifacts showing connections between the past and the present, right? So using these sorts of material records to press forward claims in the modern day. So I think there are multiple cases that we can talk about. Um, the, the one case that we started with in the lecture with uh, North Korea, for instance, I'm, I'm a little bit skeptical about the, the likelihood that that would exactly be the remains of Dangun and that that tomb should be located right outside of Pyongyang. I, I suspect there might be some political motivation here. Um, but those would be, for me, that would be the flavor of the sorts of uses or misuses of the archeological record and why it is important to question sometimes some of these claims and to further test. Thank you very much. Sure, thank you. Well, well, thank you, Nam, for your talk and also for answering so many um, tricky questions, but you've certainly given us lots to think about and debate. Um, so just a, a huge thanks once again uh, for speaking to us and, and answering our questions. Um, so this is uh, and will be the last Garrod of this term um, due to uh, postponement of the round table um, due to the strike action. So we are um, currently um, looking to rearrange the round table and we're also hoping uh, to um, also uh, run Turi King's talk, um, which we also had to cancel as well. So we've dealt with quite a lot of uncertainty um, systemically as well this term, uh, but uh, we hope that um, you'll be able to join us uh, next term for the new Garrod series um, and also um, look out for the email confirming when the round table will be in. We hope that Nam, you might be able to uh, join us in the audience and ask your own difficult questions as well then. <laughs> So um, they just need to say thank you again and um, thanks everybody for coming and, and for attending the series. Thank you so much. It, it was a pleasure and I, it was an honor to be here today. Thank you. <laughs>